It all starts with the count of three. Whether it's a roll race, a dig race, or just the green light at your local drag strip, the feeling of acceleration is exhilarating. But what is even more exhilarating is when you add another car to the mix. The feeling of racing in any form is a natural crave to compete with others. I mean, shoot, that's why things like the Olympic Games exist in the first place. Now before we get started, this film does not condone any type of street racing, nor any other illegal activities that involve automobiles. But we are going to open the door to conversation about the issue and also analyze car culture in general as a whole. So fasten your seatbelt, it's going to be quite the ride. Chapter 1, Street Racing. Street racing by definition is the illegal form of motor racing that occurs on public streets. So the streets that you and I use to get to work, travel on, and so on and so forth. There are several different types of street racing like sprints, which are things like bull run or cannonball, that are point to point races over long distances. There are also organized dig races, which are much more like something you would see at a local drag strip out on public roads. Two cars go from a dig, which means from a dead stop. And last but not least, now the most popular form of street racing, roll racing. What is roll racing? No, it has nothing to do with the butter rolls from your local Golden Corral. It is exactly what it sounds like. Two cars line up next to each other at a certain speed, they count to three, and they go. Roll racing takes a lot more driver error out of the equation and sees what the actual car can do once it's up to speed. A lot of the time, starting at different speeds can have different results. So if somebody asks for a 40 roll, they are asking to start from 40 miles an hour. Pretty simple, right? Other than having that smooth start, one of the biggest appeals of it is that it is much easier on the car, therefore it doesn't break stuff as often. Starting from a dig or a dead stop really puts a ton of stress on the car, especially on the rear end. Street racing versus the track. So I now know that most of you are probably wondering, if you can do all this at your local track, then why even risk losing your license or going to jail? I mean, shoot, even one of my first conversations with one of my car friends was telling me that he had been to jail for street racing. Oh, blood, sweat, and gears. Oh, how times have changed. Early YouTube days, good times. But one of the biggest one overall is, drum roll please, convenience? Well, yeah, street racing is extremely convenient. It's nearby, it's cheap. And if nobody's around, you don't really seem to be bothering anybody. It's roads you usually know in your area. Going to the track is usually, well, a hassle. Well, let me explain. There are two tracks near where I am from. Both are about an hour away. Now, if the car I wanted to race wasn't a daily driver slash isn't very reliable, it was only a fun car, then I'd probably have to buy a truck and trailer to get it there versus driving it down the street. I also would need to pay the entry fee, which at a drag strip in America isn't too shabby. It's usually between 17 and 20 bucks, but of course that adds up over time. Other tracks such as circuit tracks though, you aren't so lucky. Many circuits you have to pay hundreds of dollars even for a track day. Then you have to remember to say goodbye to your brakes and probably your tires in that session. Driving fast no matter what the setting is expensive. You, you know what, let me just say that this hobby in general is expensive so that might not be a completely valid argument. More than you can afford pal. Seeing why people street race shouldn't be that much of a shocker. If you have two fast cars in a parking lot and you want to quickly see which one's faster, it's not uncommon for people to drive a little bit, do a 10 second pull, and be done. Is it right? No, but it happens. Car people can be extremely indecisive and also impatient. We constantly change the setup of our cars. We are always onto the next thing. Ask a car person where they want to go eat and you'll get the, I don't care, somewhere cheap to save money for car parts. Instead of waiting another week or two or even a whole winter season to see which car is faster at a track, people will jump the gun and take it into their own hands. Want to see if that little Honda can take on a 630 horsepower Camaro? Hop on the highway at one in the morning really quick. Done. But it can also be done extremely unsafe like this moment here. Those are the moments that people see and associate all street racing with. Crashing, weaving through traffic, downshifting every two seconds just to make noise. That is what street racers look like. 
And unfortunately, it's true on many levels. So do I think street racing should be illegal? Well, yeah, it's kind of obvious the dangers it makes to public and non-car people alike. But it's easy to see why people do it. There's plenty of stories from places around the United States where people get let go by police without a slap on the wrist while they were caught street racing, all because of their situational awareness. There was nobody around, nobody to endanger but themselves. They had personal responsibility, usually in the late hours of the night and early morning. But when you're doing those kind of things in broad daylight near the average Joe, now those are the people that deserve to be charged. In a world where DUI and texting is much more of a common fatality in a car than street racing, it kind of brings you into perspective. Personal responsibility is a huge factor. Besides, how does a typical night of street racing go? Well, usually you meet up somewhere with friends or the cars you are interested in. You discuss who will be racing, where to go, what speed, from a dig, and other factors. However, you will always get kicked out by the police. So what happened, Josh? Uh, car got shut down. That never happens. Then you go to your first spot and see if it's clear. And of course, it's not. So then you will meet up again. Find another spot. Repeat. Eventually you'll find a spot and you'll get a few runs in and get out of there before disturbing anybody. But then you realize, is this really the convenient way to do it? Nope. Not worth it. Chapter 2. The Aftermarket The aftermarket world for cars is huge. It's an industry of millions, and the possibility for any car is almost endless. Yes, endless. Want to drop a different motor in a 240? You got it. Want nitrous? Google it. Want parts from Japan? One click away. It's incredible how easy it is to get parts as long as you have deep pockets, as Sir Brian O'Connor says. In America, unlike many countries, we have the mindset, if the car is from the factory, it isn't good enough. We constantly modify our cars, from wheels to tires to appearance to horsepower, anything and everything. If it can be changed, it probably will be if we have the budget for it and are obsessed with our four-wheeled babies. Take my car for example. It's a simple 2013 Mustang GT. It has various things done to the appearance, it's on lowering springs, and has minor mods. But if I were to tell you what was done to the car, I would probably still say it's near stock. Usually when you use the term, I built my car, it means nearly everything has been touched. Pistons, rods, forced induction, you name it. From crazy superchargers to huge turbos, we will always squeeze the limit of our motors, if we can. Which in turn creates a huge tuning industry in things like dyno days, where the air-fuel ratio, the timing, and everything comes together with your new setup like a symphony. Take this Honda for example. Who would have thought that we squeeze nearly 600 horsepower out of this little thing? Pretty fire. It is such a big habit that when we buy a car, we buy it more for the potential, not the final result it was when it came out of the box. And I quote, I wonder how much horsepower this motor can handle on stock internals. Somebody one way or another knows just from the trial and error. However, there is a downside to all of this. And that word is something in the car world that is all too common. And that word is ego. A lot of people will build a car just for the ego, just to say they have a faster car than somebody else. As for me, I've developed the mindset of, your car is faster than mine? Good for you. But for many, it's the opposite. And with the mindset of just wanting to go faster and faster, the more money gets flushed down the toilet. Almost every performance platform has their own website dedicated to that one car. It is an insane money maker in the automotive world, and it's here to stay. The horsepower war. Later down the road it becomes more of who has more money. 
Look at events like Texas 2K, for example. Back in 2008, a group of guys named IMV Films, I'm sure they're still on YouTube, so look it up, had a Kenny Bell supercharged Terminator Cobra. The car had somewhere in the ballpark of 600 wheel horsepower and ran low 11s. That's a pretty impressive car. But then they brought it to Texas to play around in the street. Back in 2008, if you had 600 horsepower, you were a damn fast car. And you could have a lot of fun. However, fast forward to now, and you need a thousand horsepower just to keep up. With that kind of horsepower hierarchy in the world of 2,000 horsepower GTRs, it gives perspective on the horsepower war. Look at car companies today, for example, and look how intense this horsepower war is. Ten years ago, we all thought sports cars of performance were going to die out in the name of eco-friendly everything. But with the new technology, we ended up making cars even more crazy than they ever had before. The original Dodge Challenger was in the 200 horsepower range, and that was considered big boy stuff. Now look at the new Hellcat with better fuel economy that makes over 700 horsepower with a warranty. It pretty much is the best time ever to be a car person if you think about it. But it also takes a certain skill to get used to something that fast. There are plenty of stories of people crashing these kind of cars right off the lot. But hey, I guess hashtag driver mod needed. It's gotten to the point where cars are so fast in the eighth mile and quarter mile that that measurement might be a little obsolete. When you have cars trapping over 200 miles an hour at times, you might as well go to the evolution of that, which is the half mile event, which has been very successful the past decade. Half mile shootouts are kind of the best of both worlds. You have all the room you would ever need to probably even top out your car, and you can race all day long as if it was the street. Dig race, roll race, whatever you want. We definitely need more of these events. But what about the owners themselves? Do car people really ever give up on their projects or their cars? Why are you so obsessed with cars? For example, this is my friend Hunter. He's a good friend of mine, and he's just as much into cars as I am. I think it gives a good level of, you know, your own personalization to something. You're always looking to like dress yourself, wear different articles of clothing to help define you, so why not do it with your car too? As a kid, I, I went around looking into cars, windows, and parking lots and, and looking just to see how fast they could go. Like, oh, look at, look at, this car can go 120 miles an hour in the speedometer and thinking that that was so cool. And growing up, the Fast and the Furious movies came out, Need for Speed came out, and, and those kind of like build your love for it and everything starts snowballing to the point where it, it becomes a passion from wanting a go-kart as a kid to, to wanting this type of car when, you're, when you get your license and then kind of growing from there. We've made a lot of repairs to this. Um, it was almost a lemon. I would almost say it was a lemon when I first got it. Um, a few thousand dollars in repairs um, when I got it. Is it justifiable? Mm, no. <laughs> it, it was a bunch of crap, let me tell you. When I bought this, within three months I had to do $2,000 in repairs because of the computer going bad on it, because of them trying to figure out that the computer had gone bad and replace everything up to the computer going bad. But, I mean, in the end, it turned out to be not such a bad thing because I basically got a tune-up <laughs> throughout it all. A bunch of preventative maintenance. That seems pretty reasonable. But why do so many non-car people question our love for our hobby in comparison to other hobbies and passions? Being around non-car people, the conversation is, is definitely a little bit tougher to get started. Um, you're always searching for, for a conversation rather than when you're with car people having something to talk about and being able to fluidly go into a conversation and have fun with it right away. At work it, it's pretty cool because um, I have a buddy who is talking about how he wants to swap a D series for a B series because he wants to make like 200 horsepower or something around it so we'll start talking about like oh yeah you need to upgrade your cams or you need to swap this motor in this one's a little better make sure you go VTEC versus non VTEC and he's like oh yeah okay and then everyone else is just sitting there looking at you like what are y'all talking about? You guys are crazy. And it's like a like your own secret language, kind of. Why do you spend all that money in your car? What's the point? Then why do you do things like fishing? Why do you have so many fishing poles? Why do you have more than one guitar? Why do you like sports so much that you aren't even playing? It just never really made sense to me. Maybe it's just because it's such a high profile hobby, since if you're a car person, it's almost all that you do and talk about every single day. Chapter 3, 
the speed laws. All right, I know you probably saw this one coming. Now, speed laws is a tricky subject due to, well, I'm a car guy and it's easy to say, now you're just biased because you think driving fast is cool and hip. Well, first of all, no, I don't think that. There's a time and place for everything. It's pretty obvious, I believe this. The one ticket I ever truly deserved was a rough one. And I learned my lesson really quick in my wrongdoing. So right now, as I approach this stoplight, you will notice one thing. It goes from two lanes to one lane. And I was in the right lane and I forgot this fact. Now any normal person in the right lane, like I am entering right now, would let the people over on the left and let them merge over. However, like a soccer mom minivan, like the one right there, I decided to do the alternative and gun it. I downshifted to second gear, I cut the minivan off by accident. This is why I cut this person off, because they just cut me off. So I drove semi-aggressive. So then I merge over, I coast along right here. The speed limit at the time was 45 miles an hour. As I'm cruising down this hill, my middle school is up ahead. And then what happened in this zone? The school zone lights came on. And being completely oblivious to that school zone light, I went past my middle school. And sitting there was an undercover Chevy Impala. And then I made eye contact and then I knew. After passing my middle school, I then turned into the neighborhood to the left right up here. And after I turned into the neighborhood, I knew I was going to have a very bad time ahead of me. He pulled me over and I got 56 miles per hour in a 25 mile per hour school zone. It was then I knew I was in a lot of trouble. He treated me with respect, but was not happy, and he had every right to be. Second, I'm here to open a conversation. Let me give credit to where credit is due. A journalist by the name of Patrick George of Jalopnik, by the way, make sure to check out Jalopnik because they have good stuff. He had a press car. This press car being the awesome car that is the Camaro ZL1, and he was driving it in the middle of nowhere in Rappahannock, Virginia. George gets on the gas and gets clocked by a lovely friend, a Virginia State Trooper, at 93 miles an hour. Okay, yeah, that's moving pretty quick, and yes, it deserves a ticket, but here's where things get ridiculous. Speeding past 80 miles an hour is reckless driving, yet there's speed limits in the United States that are 80 to 85 miles an hour on the highway. Cars can do these speeds in the right place today because they're modern and they're well put together. They have to be with all our safety regulations nowadays. 80 miles an hour being uh, reckless driving in Virginia no matter how close the speed limit is is kind of crazy and, and the fact that you can be put in jail for that at 80? With the way that cars are built today and, and how fast cars can go and the way that they're developed and just the technology nowadays is, is insane. The reason it tosses you in jail in Virginia is because it's the same misdemeanor as sexual battery and animal cruelty. So I want you to think about this. You get dropped off to jail for you know going too fast, but you're in the same jail cell as somebody who violated somebody horribly and also somebody who took Pokemon a little too far. Yet, here you sit. George even stated that the guards were shocked that he was even in there. It's a waste of time and resources. For example, take a look at these clips and try to guess how fast the car is going. All right, well, the answer is over 100. Even the Equinox is doing it. The Adventure Drive videos, by the way, you should check those out because they're awesome, taught me that in the right situation, speeding isn't as evil if you think about it if you're in the right time and place. The Germans and the Audubon have this all figured out. This is all my opinion though. It's the law and it's something you shouldn't break. However, it puts in perspective when you are driving on the highway and you might find yourself going 80 miles an hour and realizing this will throw me in jail? And it's laughably silly with our modern tech. Shoot, even when you get on the highway, hardly anybody goes the speed limit and it doesn't really affect anything. Now there's a huge amount of controversy nowadays with the police, how they treat suspects, blah, blah, blah. Yes, we all know there are corrupt cops every now and then, but my point isn't related to that. My question is, if cops were really pulling us over to serve, protect us, and keep us safe from going that five over, then why do they feel the need to hide from us before pulling somebody over? Well, it's simple. 
It's money. It's a multi-billion dollar industry. This explains the notorious bee traps outside small towns, especially in rural cities that go from 55 mile an hour speed zones to 25 mile an hour speed zones. Do I blame them? Not really. A lot of small towns survive off that revenue. It's sad, but it's true. Most of the time, traffic tickets, unless it's reckless, is not even worth fighting in court. Many just pay it and move on just to avoid the court fees and many more annoyances. Cars are the safest they had ever been. And for the most part, we have the lowest levels of traffic deaths in history. But that doesn't help the revenue growing of minuscule traffic tickets. Traffic engineers maintain that speed limits should be established according to the 85th percentile rule of free flowing traffic. This means that the limit should be set at a level or under which 85% of the people are driving. Numerous other studies have shown that the 85 percentile is the safest possible level at which to set a speed limit. There's other things like the Solomon Curve that talk about speed in relation to crashes. And also that with some people in the country obeying the speed limit and the others where it feels safe and comfortable while ignoring the speed limit is a recipe for a disaster. Inconsistent speed causes accidents. Reasonable speed limits help traffic to flow at a safer, more uniform pace. An 18-month study following an increase in the speed limit along the New York Thruway from 55 to 65 miles an hour determined that the average speed of traffic, 68 miles an hour, remained the same. Even a national study conducted by Federal Highway Administration also concluded that raising or lowering the speed limit had practically no effect on actual travel speeds. Well, what about fuel economy? Well, that didn't work out either when the speed limit was 55 almost anywhere, and it didn't really save that much gas. All right, time for our little peace and love moment. The car scene, as we stated before, has a lot of ego, and with ego comes disrespect and grudges. However, one thing I've noticed about the car scene overall is once you're in it, you're in it for good. It's an open environment as a whole. It has a few ground rules when you're trying to get into this culture. One, don't be that guy at a car event to ruin it. I'm talking to you, one wheel peeler burnouts. But the other one is don't act like you know everything. Make sure to ask questions and people will be glad to answer them. I personally, I, I love anything that someone has poured their heart and soul into. I think V8s are cool, I think four cylinders are cool. I, there's a whole mix of things and I have an appreciation for almost everything. Um, but yeah. If you go around acting like you know everything when you actually don't, it will stab you in the back later because there is always somebody out there that knows more than you do. That applies to pretty much everything in life, not just cars. Be true to yourself. Be honest. Love the car life and have respect and people will love you right back in return. Don't be one of those people just to build their car to show off. Have a car that you love personally. Build a car that you love personally and don't care about what other people say. One of the most common issues in the car culture is people being so judgmental and seeing a project that they feel the need to go up to the owner's face and tell them how horrible it is in their eyes. When you're at a meet, I mean, you'll have the guys who like Mustangs and they're all like Mustangs, oh look at the Honda. And then I'm like at the same time like, I have a German car, but I still love Hondas, and I still love V8s and Mustangs and Corvettes and that kind of thing. So for me, I'm just have to be like, okay, I get where you're coming from, but at the same time, I'm like, but those are really cool too. Well, guess what? That owner doesn't care about what you think because it's their car. Besides, why do you care so much if you don't like it? Stop wasting your time talking trash about others and focus on what you want to do. It's very common at night car meets especially for somebody to point out a car and say, gosh, what a hunk of junk, and then turn around and find out that they don't even have a car. In other words, they had no room to talk. To those people, I love you, but shut your mouth. Have an open mind, enjoy your cars, and enjoy this life. I'm David Patterson, and thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and have a fantastic day.